So this is chapter 16, Healing Abuse and Victimhood with Michael Rice. And all these sessions are recorded and shared publicly to support others in these teachings. Just to quickly introduce myself. So I'm Yinka and I run here My Voice Book Club, which is an inspirational self-development books. This is a quick of what we've got on this week. We've got children's meditation with Shoshana tomorrow, Saturday, Insanity and Jodie Spencer's Meditation, Sunday, Qigong, and Transformational Stories. Oh yeah, and we've got the 5am club in the morning tomorrow. We have our next online monthly book club, 16 Seconds Debunking the Myths Around a Manifestation, with Pamela Lid Lidford and Sandra Stocks will be joining us for those sessions. And we'll be doing it in person in Waterstones in Manchester in Deansgate on the 11th of April. And hopefully they'll be able to join for that too. And on the 11th of April, we'll have Michael back again in two weeks. Yay. Yeah. And on the 18th, we've got Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself monthly book club, which is chapter five. And we do have WhatsApp groups keeping people connected. And here, My Voice Book Club runs non-profit events that everyone can take part, regardless of financial status. Any donations will go into support of Michael Rice and his teachings. So why is this happening to me again? And you can do that on um, whyagain.org and send any donations if anyone feels inspired to or would like to support Michael. We're just going to start off with some shoulder rolls and just release the day so we can get ready for the session so just a nice deep breath in draw up the shoulders big inhale through the nose big exhale through the mouth as you draw the shoulders back and down nice deep breath in and exhale one more time nice deep breath in and exhale Uh, Yinka, I have a short question concerning the LOA um, on Sunday. Oh yes, that's on Sunday. Yeah, can, can I can I join and yes, can I, I will send you the link. Yeah, and and can I? I have the old link. Is it the same? No, it won't be the same link. It'll be a different one. Ah, okay, but yeah. but you could send me. Yes, I'll send you that. So that's oh. our look. We've got a law of attraction. Um, on marathon on Sunday, um, I we hosted a session at one. I think mine's at one o'clock, one till half two. So if anybody wants to join that, they can do as well. Just message me for the link. It's not my session, so it's a separate Zoom link. So Michael Rice is the founder and director of Heartland Self Healing Center. Michael Letches and teacher of health and healing and true meaning of true forgiveness. Michael is married to Jeannie Rice and hopefully Jeannie won't um, mind me sharing this but Jeannie is also creating her own book and hopefully she'll bring it to the book club too. Um, and this is just a, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing but just a little sentence from the book. So we move through time and space yet our past is always there. How we perceive our lives is the mold we yeah, use to create our world. But it is all up to us to be willing to go there, look upon the demons and lies and let them go to accept his plan and move towards its fulfillment. Are you ready for this journey towards healing generations? Let's do it together, one breath at a time. So I'm looking forward to Jeannie bringing that to the, uh, to the book club. Well, let me make, and seeing as how you brought that up, let me announce that. Oh, let me stop sharing so we can see. We'll it. have to send you a copy of it. But uh, in any event, Jeannie is going to be doing a uh, Healing the Whole Woman intensive the last week of September, the first week of October. So it's going to be over a period of two weeks. She's going to do it via Zoom, so you can do it from home. And let's see. She just handed me the flyer when I saw you announcing that. I went and grabbed the flyer from her. It's going to include... Two personal code evaluations. Personal code evaluation, well, you've done it, uh, Yanka, so mm -hmm. you, you know what yeah. it does. But, but basically, it is a uh, 
it's based on what's called the MMPI, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which is kind of the gold standard of psychological testing. It's something we've used the personal code evaluation you know, created about 40 years ago. And what it does is it breaks one's personal code, the rules one's mind uses to, to do our lives. It breaks it down into 10 areas and shows you where your your work is, where your weakness is, and gives spef- specific assignments for what to do. So there are two personal code evaluations. Uh, there's a one of the things we do when we do an intensive at Heartland is we do total fresh and raw food, or when we do an intensive on the internet, if somebody's ready to upgrade their dietary regimen too, we have a, uh, a private Trello app, uh, Healing Through Food, which has 14 weeks, three days a week of fresh and raw meals. And then we have a uh, Healing Through Pro- Food private Facebook page. It just goes with our intensives. And it goes through all the things that you need in order to do fresh and raw food, the whole basis of it, their videos, their audios, and then there are uh, preparation, everything to to support people who want to shift out of a, a kitchen that's strictly designed to eat dead animals from. And uh, so there's what it will include. And then the workshop she's going to cover are why is this happening to me again? Uh, responsibility communication. Communication, did you hear what I think I said? Codependence, power person dynamics. Purpose, personal power and commitment. Empowered to heal and mind shifters and still point breathing. So that's what she's going to be doing in that uh, two-week period. So the last uh, week of September, the first week of October. And I'm looking to see, there are going to be 32 hours of uh, Zoom time. The exact times are to be determined at this point. And the cost of the uh, the full 32 hours of the, the uh, two weeks is uh, 1600 They're going to be two sessions, longer sessions, Saturday and Sunday each week. And then in the evenings, there'll be uh, other sessions. They're, they're all, she's in, she just decided to do this today, had somebody ask if she would. And so, so if you're interested in that, you could send Jeannie an email to J-E-A-N-I-E at W-H-Y-Again.org. So if you have any questions about it, you want to register for it. If you want more specifics, then you could uh, drop her a note and she'll be glad to share with you what that intensive is going to look like. So. Would you be able to send me the information and then I can share it in the group as well? In the group chat? Well, I'll, let me go just ask Jeannie to get it off to you. Give me one yeah. second, I'll put the flyer. So she would like you to send her the flyer, whatever link she's out, and she'll put it in. Pretty good. I'll just put the, the details in the chat as well for my on my group stuff. It's on the way to you. Thank you. You will have it shortly. So cool. It's powerful when she does an intensive. I was actually in the background of one that she did. We did a residential one uh, in North Carolina, right at a, we had rented a facility on the beach and I did a 16 day intensive and she did a nine day intensive. It was really powerful to watch a group of women come together and, and addressing women's issues in a, a way that was private to women. And uh, I mean, they dealt with, there were several women there who'd, who'd lost children, had lost uh, you know babies, uh, abortion. And it was just really powerful to, to, to see the support that came forward and the, the, uh, the shift that happened in people's lives. Pretty cool, pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. So where are we going to go from here, young lady? So we're going to go into breathing, (laughs) to remember to breathe Breathe. through the session. (laughs) 
because holding your breath is exactly how you acquire a past about something and carry it with you. Holding your breath attaches the pain of an experience to a reality in the mind. So our previous chapter, which was uh, Richard, a successful man in his late 30s, following the breakup of another marriage, had contacted Michael. Richard felt his life was a mess and was desperate and wanted Michael's help. Definitely resonated with that. <laughs> in previous chapter 15, Transition, we looked at letting go of the part of us that need to heal. Looking at true forgiveness means we will lose a very dear friend, victim. Playing the victim will no longer be a part of your life in the presence of true healing. Important piece in the puzzle. Yeah. That's really stuck with me since last time we've done it. That's the victim in my mind. I want to go into that victim role. Definitely time to let go of it. You know, probably one of the greatest atrocities done to us as human beings, and I've said this before, but it can never be heard too often, especially if it's a new idea to someone, is that we've had hit from us the fact that we are by nature creatives. You and I are creative beings. And we create what happens in our lives. And that's an idea that everybody loves, especially when the creation is going well. <laughs> but when the creation is not going so well, everybody knows who the problem is. And, and it's always them. But the thing to get is that every time it's happened to you, you're the one who's been there. And when you realize that you're involved in your life, life doesn't just come along and happen to us. We're creative beings. We set up the energetic patterns. It doesn't mean, you know, that I said to somebody, oh, I want somebody to come and beat up on me. But if I hold a reality that, you know, let's say I was two and, you know, I spilled sand in my brother's eyes and I got a beating and, and I was told how evil I was and how bad that was. Hmm. If I buy that message from my power person, then I spend the rest of my life literally energetically setting up a message in my mind. And, and in order for something to move in your mind, you know, we'll go back to the physics of it. Electrons have to move. Every electron that moves creates an energy wave. You know, you drop a pedal, pebble in a pond and waves move out from the pebble. A thought moves in your mind and waves move out from your mind. They're measurable actual energy waves. And with those, if I hold from that experience, oh, I did that terrible thing and I deserve to be punished, then literally until I go inside myself and forgive, access and remove that information, then I'm always sending out a signal that says, is there anybody in the world knows how to punish me? And guess who's going to show up? Somebody who knows how to punish you. And they'll do it. And they'll do it. And they'll do it until you change the part of you that's asking for it. So that's just kind of baseline information to have an understanding of. Well, Michael, I'm not to blame for Nobody said anything about blame. I didn't say you were to blame for anything. It's just responsible. You're a creator. What comes in your life comes because you create it. If you're not willing to face the part of you with which you create it, then you'll keep creating it. It'll go on forever. So we're here to provide the tools with which to go inside ourselves and see what the hook is inside of me with which I draw people in who are willing to do those sorts of things and change the game. So that's what we're here for. Me thinking now about my hook. So this is it's clear to me that I set myself up. Strange as it sounds, I was comfortable in the role of a victim. I practiced it all my life. I didn't realize I caused the trauma that was my constant companion, Richard volunteered. It seemed to benefit me to show how wounded I was, how much of a victim I was, because people didn't tend to hold me accountable. It seemed to save me from the further punishment and put me in control. I can see, however, 
The first step in the process of becoming a victim was my choice to be victimised. Uh, so can you relate? Now, this is a totally unconscious process we're talking about. I, I rarely, well, actually, there's an old story about, you know, what does the, uh, the true sadist say when a masochist says, beat me? The true sadist says no. When I set up a field that invites someone to come in and play it out with me, and I was actually working with someone this morning. I've uh, I'm, I've created a a one on one three day personal intensive that I'm now doing with people, and I was working with a person this morning. And this whole topic came up, and not only was she able to trace the events in her life currently, several years ago, years before that, years before that, and then to her grandmother and her aunt living out exactly the same things. And once that picture became clear, it's like, oh, so that's the energy that I hold and I said, yeah, and, and what we want to do at this point is we want to change the title of my book from why is this happening to me again to why am I doing this to myself again? And the only reason I'm doing this is because I hold the energy. And the energy can be from generations and generations and generations. And we want to empower people to undo that. can you relate to Richard where has being the victim seemed to have benefited you? This is any viewers. If anybody does want to share, you're welcome to unmute and share. I can put it in the chat. Yeah, well, I can definitely relate to that. Um, because when I trace it back, I know that, like, what I was taught was to be a victim. Like, the person that taught me it was a victim and then taught me to be a victim. And then the only way we related was if we were both victims. So I can see totally that as an adult, I thought that was how you relate to people. Um so I totally get that. I'm starting to, it's it's like being hard walking across a bridge with the trust that I could be thriving and empowered and still relate to people. And that's like the bridge I've been going across. So nice. That's awesome. Total, yeah. Thank you. Holding the space for it. Thank you. Anyone else say you share? I was just going to share that. Um, for me, my grandma was always the victim, always played the victim, but it needs to infuriate me. But Well, um, uh, let me let, wait for just a second. Let me see if I get this right now. Something outside of you, it infuriates you. Yeah. Really? I, you know, I'm going to have to check my records. Out. I didn't know that was even possible, that something outside of you could actually cause something to happen inside of you. That's... That seemed so how do I pinpoint what it is inside of me that is infuriated rather than she infuriates well, the, me? Well, the first thing to do, remember our definition of denial. When I think or speak as though something outside of me is a cause of what's moving inside of me, I have to hide the real cause. I have to dissociate from the part of my mind that's creating this in order for my mind to create a false image that it's being done from out there. So that's the first thing to get. And the mind is an evidential device and it always gives you the evidence you ask it for. So when you say, you know, that makes me sad, afraid, mad, whatever it is, your mind, you could imagine, responds with, okay, uh, I, I understand now. So we're the only one that's been there every time we've been mad. 
But what you're telling me is, with your language, you don't want me to show you part of you which holds this mad and repeats, repeats, repeats it. You want me to show you a picture of somebody else causing you mad. And the mind being an event, that's what it will do. When I simply shift my language into, you know, I had an interaction with such and such a person and boy, did the rage come up in me. Oh, now I've said to my mind, mind, there's rage in me. I'm willing to look at it. I don't have to dissociate from it anymore. If I've lived my life all in, in projection language, you do a workshop called communication. Did you hear what I think I said? There's responsibility language. Gee, what you just said brought up a lot of rage in me. So now I'm owning that it's my rage. And there's projection language. You made me so enraged. And my mind will show me evidence to back it up. So as the first step is correcting my language. And then I'm able to see more clearly what's mine. And of course, how do I resolve it? Well, if you go back to our radio show archives, they started 14 years ago, been in, uh, at least an hour to two hours a day for 14 years, five days a week. And if you went back to the first minute of the first show and started listening and listened to every hour, I wouldn't address any other question than that one. How do I do that? It's every tool we've got. That's what everything that we do is about. And the most powerful or one of the most powerful and most important tools is simply to breathe is simply keeping your breath open because you'll notice when you said and and that really you know made me angry you notice your breath stopped mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so breathing is key forgiveness comes right in there so i have that uh situation I think that that was like victimhood um, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. I got um, my job is gone. It, it's not. I'm not fired, but my company is leaving from where I I live. Mm. So that in in, in that moment, um, I felt. Yeah, I felt. I think I felt like a victim, thinking. It would be good is, if we could see your face, Corey. And I think in that moment, I, um, I I thought that that was like, yeah, that was a thought um, that is, uh, yeah, that like a victim, that that something is happening to me, which is not, um, it is not supporting me. It's it is. We just lost your voice, Corey, and your face. Is it alive, Corey? We lost you, Corey. Well, let's go ahead and move forward and we'll see when Corey gets back. Okay. Something must happen to her technology. So key fault, there are no victims, only volunteers. We volunteer with the, the realization realities we hold. So we volunteer with the realities we hold. So all I have to do is hold particular mind energy and there is going to be a match there's going to be a resonance that's going to arrive in my world and deliver what i'm focused on and if i get lost in what comes up in me then i tend to reinforce the process if i realize that gee yeah there's part of me that holds that this is the way my life is supposed to be and i apply forgiveness to that and i can start to see whole different possibilities with my mind rather than being stuck in the same loop like it might look like you know for you Corey it might look like gee my job is gone and now I can open and start looking at what other awesome creative possibilities there are for my life and it might be the biggest opportunity you've ever had but as long as the mind is using the mind energy of victimhood then 
not likely you're going to be able to see it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And I could, what you said, I could later on change it into that. And now it's, I'm, I'm good with that. But that in that moment was really um, the pain what I felt like something has hurt me or something and what was I mean they can go where they want but the, I mean can I avoid in the in the future to, to feel that pain or is that norm or, or that that feeling of something outside is giving me the pain it, it sounds like a perfect worksheet topic Well, the question is, um, and, and it's like your your microphone is muted or something. I can just hear you in the background, Corey. I can't really hear your voice. I can make out most of the words you're saying, but it's difficult to uh, to understand exactly what you're saying. Is it is it no better? No, it's very low. Yeah, it's like the volume has been turned way down, or or muted, perhaps. Uh, no, no, not not. But I cannot. I don't know what. You got anything covering the mouthpiece? I can go out and come in again. Okay, let's try that and see how it works. I'll go on to the next slide while she returns. Okay. So as I look at it, I can see I purposely played the victim role to keep people from victimizing me. What manipulation, what a twisted way of news people, he mumbled to himself. As I think about it, I fed on the energy of fear. It was that and anger. They seem to be my choice, only two choices. I really have some work to do if I'm going to change the foundation of my relationships from fear and anger to love, Richard Shedd. Big time. Yes. And to have a relationship based in love, each person in the relationship is going to have to function out of love, out of our true human lives, what we're really created of, rather than functioning out of the dynamics in the mind from the past generations. So can you resonate with Richard and see times you have used victim to help people from um, to keep people from victimizing you? Can you recognize times you have also fed on fear and anger instead of love? Yeah, a person that I worked with recently uh, was sharing that they had almost committed suicide. And their thought process was, well, you'll see how wrong you are and how badly you hurt me after I'm gone. It's like, hmm, boy, there's a, a, a circle to get stuck in. So the thought process was, I'm going to kill myself so that you'll feel really badly and you know how badly you hurt me. Now, this person's out there doing stuff that's quote unquote hurtful. Do you think they're going to stop and go, oh, how terrible? That's the game of the victim, though. And it's just time, you know, it's like time for us to step up to responsibility and get rid of this whole victim game that uh, that our culture has taught us to play. It's interesting how we have been taught it so, and it comes so easily. I mean, there are people who are professional victims. You listen to what's going on in the political scene, political scene here in the States. And, you know, w one of the biggest guys who pretends to be the most powerful and the most um, dynamic and the richest, he's a bigger victim than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, every other word out of his mouth about, oh, poor me, look what they're doing to me. It's like, 
Okay. Time for some healing. And one of the keys to that is to breathe. Bottom of the page. Anybody want to share any experiences? Anything that they can recognize in themselves? Yeah, I mean, that, that suicide the thing that you're talking about, that has happened to me over my life. You know, I've it's crossed my mind that not now, but, you know, in the past, I've had moments of that where I've gone, that, that would show the person that you know hurt me that would that would serve them right that they found out that that's what I did do you know what I mean because and it's like it's just a it's been a fleeting thing that's been come and then gone but it I really understand being that bogged down in it and that low in it right that it's that it's almost you go to those lengths in your own mind before you check yourself and go, oh my gosh, what am I thinking? You know? um, and, and I think that was to a, be a generational pattern. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, again, the person that, you know, <laughs> is the person that was the victim was like that. Um, if I ever sort of tried to thrive in any way or sort of step out of the victim, then it, then that person would be like, oh, don't, I'll, you know, I'll commit suicide if you move away from, from that dynamic sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I can, I can just see how that pattern has played out. And I think the, the other thing is that um, a, a lot of the situation that I'm currently in is kind of, a, I've ended up repeating what that person did even though I moved away from that person I've got away from that person for like over 10 years and yet right. some of those patterns in my life still have still off. happened yeah and I've been so confused by that because I thought I've cut the cord so it so I never ended up like that and then some things have ended up like that and I'm like oh my god cutting the actual physical cord hasn't done it you know it's actually cutting the cord on how my creation delivers what I've created doesn't change what I'm creating. I've got to go yeah. in here. I've got to go in the inner space and start to forgive. And, and remember that forgiveness in this, in the first century Aramaic context has nothing to do with, I'm going to let them off the hook because of what they did to me. You now, if they did something terrible, nasty, whatever, it's perfectly appropriate to pardon them. But most people call pardoning forgiveness. And they think, well, now I've forgiven them, therefore, everything should be okay. And that's just the biggest lie that's ever been told. Never forgive anybody for anything. Pardon them, if you will, call it what it is, and then go inside and do your forgiveness work. Elsewise, your past is going to chase you. you know, you'll be living the title of my book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again? Yeah. Or why am I doing this to myself again? Mm. Yeah, it makes total sense. Thank you. Thank you. So the worksheet process is going to be really important for you, freeing yeah. yourself of that whole game, literally freeing yourself of it. Yeah, I definitely have been looking at that. Yeah. And it's, cool. it's it's making me much more aware of this now. Awesome. Well, there is a, you know, we did a Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop some time ago, and uh, it's in the archives if you want to get that. And that lays out the whole forgiveness process. And then there are several shows that we've done or, uh, where we've walked somebody through the whole worksheet process, step by step by step. So you might want to watch some of those and or you can go to our website, whyagain.org. And under the video link, there are several links to special shows. And there are about 20 different shows where you actually give the instructions for and walk somebody through the whole worksheet process. So you might want to start listening to those to understand the forgiveness process. And also you can uh, download the... Uh, the world's only forgiveness app. If you go to your app store on your phone and type in Heartland, H-E-R-T-L-A-N-D, Aramaic forgiveness, you can do that forgiveness process right there on your phone. 
and right from within the app, if you have a question, you know, I'm, gee, I'm doing step three in the worksheet and this doesn't make sense. Then you can ask the question, send it to, you know, just hit send. Jeannie will get it. She'll read it on the radio show. We'll answer the question and then we'll send a link back to you. So you've got access to that, uh, that answer. Every way we can support you, we're there to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Yanka. I'll put them in chain of guilt and blame. Uh. So love is the most powerful force on earth. It seems one of the benefits of giving up blame and guilt and letting go of the ball and chain is regaining my power, which means the choices you make are the key. The choices you make and the realities that you hold to. How you lose playing the victim becomes available for you to consciously recreate your life. So being a victim, it takes a lot of energy. It's a very powerful, creative process. When you give it up, all that power becomes yours to use and direct consciously. And I often feel like that carrying all that baggage around. <laughs> Sharon, you have a question for us? Um. Yes, it, I don't. To be quite honest, I need to read the theory. And but basically, what it is, I've really been trying to do that breathing technique. And um, so when I've come up across the blocks, I've been really trying to breathe through it. It's, um, and it's helped for a little while. It feels very temporary, and I guess I've got to keep doing it. But it, it, it the pain comes back again. <laughs> Yeah, the, the still point breathing process is something that we don't, I mean, our, our continuous invitation to people is pay attention to your breath and keep breathing. But the specific still point process is not something that I write about or teach other than in a live workshop, because it's something that um, you need direct experience with and support to get started with. I mean, ultimately, it's meant to be used for yourself by yourself. But mm -hmm. the intensity of the experiences that it brings up, uh, if people don't have support, they tend to run away from it then. So so you might want to uh, join at least for you know, one session, maybe the Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing Club happens once a month and you'll get some instruction on how to use that breath and how to follow through and move through things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a quick question, Michael. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, where did you say we could find the uh, the forgiveness app? That's one thing I'm learning, I'm working on oh. at the moment, and I think that's what's okay. stopping me from moving on with things. If you go into your app store on your phone, yeah, and just type in Heartland, one word, H E A R T L A N D. Yeah. Second word, Aramaic, A R A M A I C forgiveness you'll see an app with a red glowing heart come up somewhere in the list that's our app okay all right cool Good. thank you i'm gonna put all the details in the chat again as well awesome awesome great uh, pick of pictures for this to illustrate this point. Once again, Yinka, you know, takes a lot of energy to carry around that that garbage, and once it's dropped, I've got the power is now available to use consciously. I have a quick question. Um, I am doing a lot of this work at the moment, uh, meditating on Joe's work the last three months straight and I'm slowly losing this the the, the ties to these blame, blame guilt and shame and it's working thank god it is working um, all right <laughs> it's really really it's fun it's scary because you have to go into the unknown because you're like oh my god what if I you know if you let go of the guilt or the shame especially the blame and and the blame carries the anger you know it's, so it's, it's there's a whole cycle and then you have to change things so I'm doing the stop change game 
Um, but I'm more, I'm aware of what when I'm doing it. It's not just changing everything. I'm changing the negative side of things, not changing my whole life. Right. You know? <laughs> changing. Um, as I'm doing it and I'm really getting into the process, I get scared sometimes and I almost think, oh, it's nice. To, not 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 that it's nice to complain, but it's nice to I, I feel like I don't resonate with anyone and I feel like I'm really alone on this journey, which is fine. But I feel find sometimes I slip back into the old ways because it's easier to feel like that. <laughs> Did you ever feel like that when you're going through something like that? It's easier. It's like the, the unknown is a bit scary. And I just I'd love to dive in because I'm doing a lot of um like I'm I'm doing my letter. I'm writing my letter and I'm doing my intentions and the elevated emotion. But I can't seem to fo- put everything in because it's there's still some strings attached to the path. Have you tapped into the forgiveness worksheet, the reality management worksheet? Yet? I'm doing reality management. I haven't done much about forgiveness, unfortunately. Okay. Well, the reality management, if you're talking about our worksheet, that yeah. is the format for forgiveness. That's okay. a step-by-step process for okay. how to forgive. I've done it a few times, but not not yeah. consistently. Okay. So I'd, I'd be doing some around whatever this the issue is that you're talking about. And, you know, oftentimes people who are in that blame game and that victim role, it's how they get the energy. It's, it's like, gee, people pay attention to me when I'm in victimhood. <laughs> yep. And it can become an addiction. So there, you know, yeah. there's the next worksheet. Um, because as Joe says, we are addicted to our emotions. That yeah, most people are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my my take is that the main addictive emotion is the hostility. And oh. it literally, you know, most people think of of hostility or anger as as an emotion, but it's actually an internally produced addictive drug it anesthetizes pain Uh, and one of the first steps is to give that drug up so that i can directly confront what's underneath it you know you can sit with the the drunk you know drunk out of their mind and you can explain till the cows come home how to heal but they're not going to come out of there drunk and go oh i can remember that lecture i think i'll do something about that it's no different anger is the same thing i need to stop i need to become an abstainer from that drug and consciously purposely do my work to move through the other side and it looks like Corey's back but i don't know if is it better now you're loud and clear now oh great okay so any other thoughts for you um no, I found that very interesting what you said about anger. And I can you repeat that a little bit? Because that was, is very interesting yeah. for me. Yeah. Yes. Anger yeah. is no different than alcohol. It's an internally produced anesthetic. You know, you, you listen to the, you know, what was the song that was written about alcohol? Feeling no pain. Alcohol mm-hmm. is an anesthetic. Hostility, rage. Anger is an anesthetic. It, it it anesthetizes pain. If you watch people who are trying to break, let's say, an alcohol or a drug addiction, one of the things you'll notice is that as their stress builds and they're not dealing with what's going on inside of them, and you can see them getting closer and closer to falling off the wagon using their drug, whatever it is, before they do that, the last effort they'll make to anesthetize against that pain before they actually take the drug again or start drinking again will be anger. And they're Mm -hmm. trying to anesthetize that unconscious pain. I worked with a woman several years ago in South Florida and she was Mrs. Housewife. Her husband was a, a very wealthy businessman, very successful businessman. And she stayed home with the kids. He worked. He'd get home late every night, 8.30, 9 o'clock. She'd have dinner ready. They'd have two or three drinks before dinner. They'd have a bottle of wine with dinner. They'd have two or three drinks after dinner. She was an alcoholic, according to her, but that was her routine for years. That was what they did. When she started doing this work, she decided to stop doing alcohol and really dug in and did a lot of pretty deep work. It was about five years later in a session that she shared with me that the weekend before she had been at a party and, you know, she hasn't touched alcohol now for about five years. 
She'd been at a party and somebody offered her a drink of hard liquor. And she was like, well, yeah, why not? And what she shared was that the liquor no more than got past her lips and it felt like razor blades in her kidneys. She could feel the damage being done by the alcohol. And my my take was the reason she could feel that and the reason why most people don't feel that is because they're using it to anesthetize pain. She'd done a lot of work to get rid of her pain. So now she's feeling the physiological impact of the alcohol on her tissue. Wow. Oh, okay. So in, instead of feeling the pain, that was then the was the alcohol was was used. Instead of feeling the pain, you watch the person who compulsively reaches for the alcohol or the drugs, and bef just before that, you watch. That's where they're they're in anger. Again, it's drug. That's all. It's an internally produced drug. It's a difficult drug to get away from because it's free and it's internally produced. You know, the alcoholic can at least say, okay, I'm not going to have alcohol in the house. I'm not going to the liquor store and bringing alcohol in my home. Can't do that with hostility. You have to become really committed to quit. And that means just feel, feel the pain or feel what it is inside. Feel what's going on. Yeah. And, and the, your, what we call feelings or emotions, they're the warning signals about what you're doing to yourself. You engage in mind energy that doesn't belong in your structure. Your structure warns you with a painful warning sig sig signal. Mm -hmm. If we listen to those signals, then we start connecting the signals with, oh, what am I doing with, to myself? And that's when we start changing the whole thought pattern, the whole game that we play. And mm -hmm. the gathered up, the, the lifetime of trauma that we've been anesthetizing against, when you stop using the anesthetic now, has to be unfolded. It has to be worked through. It's just part of the process. Mm -hmm. Cool. Miss Yinka? So process. This is not an event that happens in a single moment, but a process that results from being responsible for what you set up in life. Notice that the truth is safe and healing. Now that you are aware of behavior patterns that you don't um, serve, that don't serve you, you are in a position to change them. That's empowerment power i think that's really important to remember the process isn't it because we think that we sometimes you want it just i want it the second it's done yes mm -hmm. and sometimes it is a process especially the worksheets yeah i want it yesterday yeah that's so true you said yinka about um notice that the truth is safe and healing that's my biggest uh thing i i, I learned in the last three months is that feeling is safe and healing. I used to think the feeling was bigger than me and that I would not survive. <laughs> so it's safe and healing. Right. Cool. Let's go for it. I'm going to put it on two slides because key thought, when you choose to be aware of behavior patterns that don't serve you, you are in a position to change them. That's empowerment. It's empowerment. So it sounds like the only way you thought you could step into your power other than through victimhood was through hostility, offered Michael. That is exactly what I thought. Without my anger, I was powerless, Richard confided. I have noticed that myself when, you, when I'm angry, it kind of gives me that drive to actually take some sort of action. But that is the type of action that it's driving me to take. Yeah. And and action taken from anger, you know, one of the things that occurred to me a long time ago was the tools we use to produce a result always produce a result like the tools. So when I use anger to 
try to feel my my oats, feel my power, I'm going to produce a result that brings more anger into my life. If I move in the direction of taking action out of active present love, then I'm going to tend to bring more active present love into my life. So hostility is one of the most addictive, damaging drugs that drugs there is. Every person who engages in it needs their fix to keep their pain suppressed. Those who use this drug encourage others to do the same be because they themselves have not faced what they have suppressed with their own anger. Often the realisation that we have a right to our anger is news to justify holding on to this form of self-abuse. We must be willing to deal with that what we have hidden from ourselves and stop using that drug if healing is to occur. Yeah, if you remember that line on the worksheet that says, what I put out, you know, that when I engage in something, I get the original. They just get the carbon copy. When I do hostility, and, and when people do that hostility game, literally it is a destructive chemistry relative to the cell. But one's anesthetized against the impact of their own hostility on themselves, and they think they're just puking it on someone else. They have no idea their pain is caused by their own hostility. It's got to go. So what are you talking about? Do drugs suppress pain, asked Michael. Richard nodded. If you look at someone who is extremely hostile, you will always find deep emotional pain. Hostility sets up body chemistry that suppresses pain. Using hostility is like using any other drug. If one stops using the addictive substance, in this case, the internal chemistry produced by hostility, they will go into withdrawal when the pain the drug has suppressed surfaces. This, um, that is the point at which the craving gets so strong, many return to their supplier for another fix. Yep. I can see that in myself as well. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty common principle. It's easy. It's, well, it seems like the easy option. Seems like it. But here's the thing. You know, people say, well, it'd be so hard to live lovingly all the time. That, that sounds just so hard. It's like, no, living in hostility is hard. But if that's the pattern of your power person, it's automatic. It doesn't take any effort. To live as a human being, as love, takes effort. It's not hard. The results of it are awesome. A whole lot more joy, aliveness, all sorts of wonderful things happen when one chooses to put the effort in. But it takes effort where the, the whatever is in the automatic decision system in the mind already, it just kicks in and it's easy. No effort required whatsoever. To do it differently takes effort. So one of the biggest challenges for the host hostility addict is that the supplier is internal, a tricky pusher from which to break contact. Our hostility must be treated like any other drug. Its use must stop if one is determined to recover. The other challenge is that society is the enabler. Yes. We just got a note in the uh, chat room. Let me see, where'd to go? Pain is normal, but it takes no effort. Living in love and joy is simple, but it is not easy. It takes effort. That's it. Perfectly said. Consistency, self-awareness, and 
actually self-love i would i would not use those words in the the culture has taught us that love is something we do to each other something we get from each other something i can give to you and something you can give to me and that's just totally false it's just not true and an easy way to establish the the truth of that statement is remember a time when you held a newborn child tap into the essence of that newborn child and this is a question that Ginny and i have asked of tens of tens of thousands of people over the years what's the essence of the newborn and virtually everybody's answer is some variation on the theme of love so most people in the audience we're talking to will agree yes the child is love now ask yourself the next next question go back once again imagine holding the newborn is the newborn loving you or is the newborn love it's pretty clear that the newborn is love you and i are love we can't do love we can function as love so strictly speaking i'm not i, I don't love you at all but I choose to be responsible for keeping my human life, love, alive in my physiology when I interact with you. And I can extend that energy of love to you, but strictly speaking, this whole idea of, you know, I mean, you look at what they call love relationships, where do 50, 60% of love relationships end up in the gutter? Why? Because there were not, they're not love relationships at all. The relationships based on matching bags of garbage. So self-awareness and rather than self-love, so it's something I'm doing to myself, awareness of self as love. Now I'm taking responsibility for keeping my human created essence present in my physiology. It's a whole different process in the mind in order to be able to do that. Hope that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining. Cool. Can I just ask a question? Um, Go for it. Because, you know, you talked quite a bit about anger there. Can it work in the opposite direction where, because I actually ended up struggling to even acknowledge or express anger. Um, in, so can it work the opposite way that a, a kind of pushing away of that emotion is just the opposite side of the coin. Uh, yeah, my take would be, you know, most people who are pushing away anger are people who were punished for their anger in their early lives. It tends to involve a power person dynamic. And so mm -hmm. if there's a power person dynamic where I'm not allowed to express anger, dad can, mom can, but I can't, yeah. then that's going to be shut down and I'll try to push it away, which is all the more important to get in touch with it, which is what the forgiveness process will empower you to do or will support you in doing. And then rather than getting lost in it and going, well, now that I you know, will see people who for the first time, it's like, well, now it's okay for me to do my anger thing. It's like, yeah, I, I mean, if that's your choice, it is. But you might want to just really hold the space of being aware of how much damage you're doing to your own physiology. Anger is a very destructive chemical in the structure. And so once you realize that it's okay to express your anger, then I suggest you follow that up very quickly with, and it's okay for me to forgive my anger, heal my anger, mm -hmm. and be finished with it, and speak from the core of being, which is love, is where the only real empowerment is. Wow. That's, that's really powerful. Thank you for that. Delighted. Yeah, that made a lot of sense. I didn't realize we can forgive ourselves for being angry. I thought anger, okay, anger is a separation of love. Yeah. I get that. But I, for some reason, I thought I was entitled to be angry. <laughs> well, like, you are like entitled. A, I mean, I you live in a culture. You live in a culture that says you're entitled to be angry, and, and, and certainly you are. However, I don't want to, you know. <laughs> recognize that the damage that you're doing to yourself and the option would be to forgive your anger stand in and as the space of active love and that's where the real empowerment lies oh. yeah that makes a lot of sense 
a lot of people mistake strength and power. You know, somebody's got big muscles, they're bigger than I am, therefore they have the power. No, they don't have the power, they have strength, that's it. And oftentimes that strength has to use anger in order to bully or take someone over. When one is, is willing to let go of that, when one forgives that compromising energy, then the true power of human life starts to show up in their own physiology. The result of that is healing occurs physically, mentally, emotionally, relationships, financial. That's what tends to happen when people step into functioning as creators, as the human presence of love in their own minds and bodies. And sadly, we live in a culture whose specialty is, you know, when you realize that newborn is love, our, our culture specializes in knocking that out of us and then sending us out the door to find somebody to love or find somebody to love us. And that is impossible. No one has ever loved you. No one's ever going to love you. You've never loved anyone. You never will love anyone. God doesn't love you. That's a whole myth. You go back to the ancient teachings and, 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 and what they say is God is love, not God does love. We are love. We don't do love. You can't do love. You either function as love or you don't. And when you're not functioning as love, there's a false self that you need to eradicate from your mind. That's what forgiveness does. Go for it, Yinka. So in traditional drug and alcohol treatment, the enabler is the person who supports the user by covering for or assisting him or her in keeping up the habit. Most people use rationalization to avoid facing the cause. They justify addictive behavior and tolerate it as necessary because of thoughts that justify it. Yeah. How many people, you know, if there's somebody in the family that's a an hostility addict, step in and cover for, well, they didn't really mean it. Well, you know, they were upset today. They've got a, a, an excuse for them, a cover up for them. And that's enabling. If someone has consequences to experience from their anger, then let them experience the consequences. It's like the alcoholic, you know, the wife that always calls in for the guy who's who's been on a bender the night before and too sick to come into work. That's enabling behavior. Well, but gee, if I didn't call the boss and say he was sick, if I told him he was actually drunk, then maybe he'd lose his job. That would be terrible. Yeah, and if you keep covering for him and keep allowing the alcohol to happen, he may kill you. That's going to be really terrible. It's time to let people be accountable for what they do. And that's not an easy thing if... We've been raised by a power person who taught us that what we had to do was cover up for everybody. Keep the family secrets. So is there any area of your life you use hostility or you can see where you use your enabler rationalization to feed or tolerate hostility within yourself or others. I had a really funny experience yesterday. You know, I've, I've as I said, I'm I'm doing one on one personal intensive, so I've been communicating with some folks about that, and literally within a five minute period, I had three different people that were texting stuff that was just crazy, just like off the wall crazy. And I went in with my phone to read it to Jeannie. It's just like, I can remember a time when if I'd have gotten from three different sources, those kind of messages all at once, it would have been just for me. And yesterday I went in and I read them to Jeannie. It was like, when I had dealt with the part of me that would have gone into disturbance about it in the past, it was hilarious. I mean, I sat and read these text messages to Jeannie. We're both laughing at just, you know, how ridiculous this is. Rather than allowing my mind to play the game of victim, need to respond with hostility. And 
So looking at every arena in your life in which you function out of any form of hostility is a pointer to where your work is. Ah, here's another piece of work for me to do. I'm going to step in and do that work. Sorry. Um, I have the question concerning the inner dialogue. So I'm now um, very much working on my inner dialogue and, and I see that um, that the inner dialogue is also negative. And then from that negativity comes, I think that there comes the the thought and then then comes the the um, yeah perhaps also the anger the thought or the, or comes the... first the thought is the inner yeah. dialogue remember yeah. we're, one of the things we're looking at yeah. is stepping up to the plate and being willing to forgive as to thought disorders rather than just play them out because literally when i engage in a thought i literally what they've shown in the laboratory is when I think a thought, that thought, that non-physical thing shows up in my body as a physical molecule. It's called a neuropeptide. That neuropeptide circulates around in my structure until it finds a cell with a receptor site that matches. It lands on the cell. Now, if I were inside the cell watching, what I'd see is coming into the cell would be chemistry. So mind energy becomes flesh. When I engage in mind energy that is of a destructive nature to my cells, my, when that energy hits the cell, when that, that moment it lands on the receptor site, it creates a warning signal. This is not something you want to create your life out of. That's what negative emotions are. It's literally the energy of the, of the thought, the, the neuropeptide landing on the cell and the cell goes, ouch, don't do it. But because we've found ways to anesthetize ourselves, like I'll add hostility to it, then we can pretend we're not damaging ourselves. And, you know, ultimately you got to take responsibility and move through it. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that very well, what you say, but the, my question is, um, do I need to work on the inner dialogue to see what is there happening and then to to change it? Or is, is that... I'd say 2,000%, yes. That's what forgiveness is about. It's about going in to the root of the inner dialogue and changing it. Re literally addressing and removing the thought disorders that cause pain and compromise my ability to create my life consciously. That's what the whole worksheet process is about. Mm. To, to, to be very aware about the, the, the inner dialogue and the, the, the thinking, because it, sometimes with me, that goes so quick. And, and yeah. then is the, an emotion come, comes and, um, and I think, oh, what, what was the thought? Where, where does that come from? And, um, But then it's, and when we won't let ourselves touch into that, that's what we call living unconsciously. The idea is to get conscious of what we've hidden from ourselves and made unconscious. My offering is that I don't believe that human beings are designed to have an unconscious mind. Now, if you listen to the average psychologist today, they'll tell you that 80, 90, 95, maybe as much as 98% of our thinking is unconscious. That's how far away from natural we are the work is yes paying attention to everything that's going on in there you know rather than being focused out there in outer space start looking in inner space and clean up the mess which means literally cleaning up the chemistry that shows up in our physiology that's the objective of the worksheet and you've heard me say before you know one of the things to do is become the thinker apart from the thought The feeler apart from the feelings, the actor apart from the actions. Step back from your own mind and watch it in operation. 
when it's engaged in something that doesn't serve you, something, an energy that doesn't hit a cell and re result in delight and joy, get rid of that sucker. Forgive it. Which means that for most of us, I mean, if you look at the history of what's gone on on planet Earth, you know, in the, up until, you know, Jeannie did some research when she was getting her degree in psychology. So that's about 15 years ago now. And she did a research paper. And, and, and what they had shown was in the previous 75 years, humans had killed a, hundred and, a, a, a verified number. 175 million people. What do you suppose are the habit patterns of we as the generations de descendant from that 75 year period? 175 million people murdered. I mean, what kind of impact is there on parents, children, neighbors, friends? I mean, it's just it's crazy. And we're their inheritors of it. So the work is to start to clean it up so we don't have to pass that world on to our children. Go for it, Yinka. So a key thought. People deserve to live in gentle, loving environments with aliveness, delight, and joy are the norm. Anything less is an insult to the human spirit. That's exactly what we are designed of and what we are designed for. And we've gone a long way from where we're where our natural world is. So how does society enable hostile people? Well, let's take a look. These are just a few way few ways. People often support abuse in the world without realizing there isn't any option that there is anything they can do about it. They don't speak up, similar to experiences as children where you kept the family secrets. Like the woman who continues to accept the abuse of an alcoholic husband in order to maintain her lifestyle, society rationalizes that the behavior of the hostility addict is required to maintain itself. If she didn't cover for him, there would be no paycheck and her family would starve. Many children are raised in homes where being beat up verbally, physically and emotionally is normal. They resume maltreatment to be part of life. From within a society ruled by the volcano gods, sacrificing a young maiden now and then was not bizarre. Torturing and burning people at the stake was not strange from with within the belief systems of the inquisitors. It was reasonable way to save souls. Reason, when not consciously governed, can justify anything it can conceive of, anything it de decides to do. We live in a world where murder, war and violence are justified and condoned. The media regularly portray little violence as acceptable. So I think individually and collectively, we have to stop engaging in little violences. Just the violent thought, just the angry thought, just the abusive thought. When you start dealing with it there and start dissolving it, literally you change your whole physiology. Because it really got me thinking about like years back when they tortured and burned people at the stake and how normal it was yeah. then oh, it made yeah. me think what am I going to look back at and say that was that and what I thought was normal today the things that I look at and think normal in so many years time I might look back and have that same thought that I'm thinking torture is awful yeah what if every thought you thought in your whole life was based in your created use of human essence love. What if you were raised in a world where every person knew who they were as love and knew you who you were as love and they functioned out of that? I'm offering that's where we need to be heading. 
So there's a lot of work to be done. And are we willing to do it? I am. I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes I want to hide from it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking around to finish it. <laughs> Yay. So where have I been all my life, Richard said, as he fumbled for his words. I've never thought about how previous generations or the media impact us. It never occurred to me that the world could be any different. I've never conceived that my hostility supports and contributes to the dynamics of violence in the world. Look around you. You are not alone, Richard, replied Michael. So the reason for monumental violence is that many learn violence from co conception, violence in thoughts, words, and action. It's harmful nature in the family in the family has to a great degree being being ignored through it is sorry being ignored though it it is the beginning point of all conflict divorce murder and war children and adults are so confused as to what is reasonable they often do not know when they are abusing others being abused or abusing themselves the end of this insanity on our planet begins when each of us acquires and uses the tools to heal the violence we do to ourselves and others. Peace is not an objective. It is the pathway to sanity and healing. Fear and violence have been with us for all of our history, Michael. I want to live in peace as much as the next guy. But do you honestly think you can eliminate our world's insanity with these tools? Sounds like an impossible dream, quested Richard. Do you believe fear is a natural thing for us human, human beings? Asked Michael. So do you believe fear is a natural thing for us as human beings? And my offering is that fear is a totally, completely unnatural state of a human being. And what it does when people live in fear is that it creates a state that's called sympathetic dominance. Sympathetic dominance means that the blood flow in the body, literally, physiologically, the blood flow in the body is drained away from the higher centers of the brain. It's drained away from the higher functions of the body, rest, digestion, healing. And it is funnels that blood to the large muscles of the arms and the legs and the lungs to give us the oxygen to run or fight. It's called the flight, fight, flight mechanism, but it's actually fight, fright, flight fear and fawning you look at the person who you know there's that person that walks in the room and all of a sudden like oh look how great you are oh yes i'll do what you are whatever you want fawning over somebody that's a reflection of this state of sympathetic dominance in sympathetic dominance people are dying the structure is falling apart because the higher centers of the brain and the reproductive functions of the body, the regenerative functions, the immune function, the bowel, all of those functions are shut down because they're not required for survival. We need to get out of survival. We need to move out of that sympathetic dominant state, fear, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, into parasympathetic mode, which in the medical world is referred to as rest, digest, regenerate. In sympathetic dominance, those functions are dead. So we've, we've bought into a lie. It is time for us to confront the lie and face ourselves. It is time to heal the 
structures that support mental, emotional, spiritual, verbal, and physical abuse, hostility and violence in every form within families, communities, and nations must come to an end if we humans are to survive, let alone live in peace. Taking responsibility for one's own hostility and refusing the fix each time the mind automatically offers it is one of the keys to healing and aliveness. A shocking belief held by many people is that peace is not possible, nor is it desirable, and that violence is not only natural, but necessary. It is the mind's unwillingness to be responsible, deal with its hurt and heal, that promotes such an insane and barbaric dogma that peace is not possible. It is a rationalization for violence used by those who cannot or will not control their own thoughts, words, or actions. Hostility and fear is an old game of kings. No true human being will do what kings want them to do. And most kings are about, we need to make war. Somebody's got something I want. I'm going to make an, up an excuse. You're going to go fight and kill them and steal their property for me. That's the basic rule of kings. So this is just mass generated within our culture. There's big money in it. The war machine. Trillions of dollars. It's time for us to change the whole game. It's time for us, that whole thing, to be turned around. And you think about the waste of war. I mean, the resources that are wasted, the creativity that's lost, this the substance that's destroyed. What if we took all that we've got to support the hostility and war machine and we put it into feeding people and generating food and doing research on, on wholeness and healing? How different would the world be? Could anybody starve? No. And st- you know, and, and it's a profit game. So that's a, another piece of the puzzle to be aware of. And if you realize that there's some way you profit from it, i.e. even if it's just what I get attention when I yell and scream, are you willing to give that up? Because it's a thought disorder that contributes to ultimately, literally to war. And it's time for us to finish it. That's what we're here to do. That's what this book is about. Book is certainly an eye opener. Have you ever wondered why people are killed to show that killing people is wrong? My son was about five when he asked that question. Dad, why do they kill people to prove to people that killing people is wrong? Literally, that's what something my son said when he was about five. It's like. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. It doesn't make any sense. A mind in hostility or fear makes no sense except to itself. And other minds that live in that kind of hostility or fear. Once you start to work through it, once you start to remove that, those dynamics become pretty strange and pretty weird. Time to get rid of it. And glad you're here joining us to do it. And the key thought, Einstein said that you cannot solve a problem with the same mind that created it. The hostile mind is insane and cannot solve its problem. It can only be solved with the mindset of love, mindset of love. Let us have the courage to recover our lives and do the unthinkable. Question everything. Question everything. Yay. I think one of the perhaps most important uh, ideas in this particular lesson is to recognize that the tools you use to produce a result will always produce a result like the tools. It will always attract you a result that matches what it is you're doing to accomplish something. 
when you get to the point where your habit is to use those tools based in love to produce results in your life, then you become an attractive field that produces that result in your world. And so question everything that would take you in another direction. Sorry, Michael, could you quickly go over that again? And I said, if you, you know, if we use fear and anger to change something, it will be based around fear and anger. What does that mean in terms of changing the energy that we want, like the creation? So, so we, we live in a world of resonance. Yeah. Law of resonance says this, when two energy fields are in tune and are in harmony with each other, there's an exchange of information between them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is the tool you use, if you use hostility, produce a result, you literally set up an actual, literal, measurable energy wave. Mm -hmm. Through resonance, that energy wave is going to bring in more of the same. You say, that person's not nice to me, and they need to change, and I'm going to puke on them to make sure they change. My act of puking on them is going to draw somebody else who's going to puke on me because we live in a world of resonance. So mm -hmm. if I've got somebody abusing me, the first thing I want to do is start to deal with the abuse in myself. And then I want to come forward in a space of connected love to bring resolution to those things. Starting to use connected love to bring resolution in your life means that you're inf informing the world energetically that you're willing to have only love return to you. Oh, yeah. And it changes everything. So I hope that fits and makes sense for everybody. Yes, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Well, Miss Yenka, we've got another session in two weeks. Yes, we do. Um, and to, to, between now and then, we'll just breathe together. So it'll be chapter 17. So it's actually the 11th of April. The body has a mind of its own. Not Thursday, March 28th. No, it'll be the 11th of April. It, right. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah, we missed a week in there, didn't we? Oh, yeah. My bad. Not, not I'm, I apologize. <laughs> we obviously right. needed that week for something else. <laughs> Honored and delighted. Glad to be uh, be of service and uh, hope mm -hmm. you pass it on. Yeah. Thank you. And your time that you give to this, we really appreciate. Honored and delighted to have the opportunity to do it. Thank I'm you. So I learned so much from you in just that hour and a half. I've I learned so much. It takes me like leaps and bounds forward in my growth. Thank you. Well, this is just a little section of it. You know, you can download the book free from our website. Just go to whyagain.org, click on the book, and you can download it in any one of nine different languages. If you go to our the microphone on the homepage on our website, there are over 5,000 hours of conversations like this one, where we're interacting with real people in real time, answering questions about just what we did today. So there are over 5,000 hours. If you want to start listening, all of that's in there and it's free. If you go to our YouTube channel, if you just go to YouTube and put in Michael Rice, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-R-Y-C-E, -E, there are over yeah. 200 videos. So. Put it to work. Amazing. Awesome. <laughs> Honored and delighted. And if anybody wants to donate and support Michael in these teachings, as you all know that it's um donation based, if anybody does and feels that they've inspired, and you can do that on his website as well. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a blessed one. Yeah, I'm going to leave us with some music to play us out. So, all right. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Blessings, everybody. Bye. Thank you.